Hey everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Sitting Duck, a Town of Duck podcast. My name is Kay Nickens, and I'm really excited about this episode in particular because something that we talked about in the first episode with town manager Drew Havens was about how young the Town of Duck is. And we just celebrated our 22nd anniversary of incorporation. And when we think about how young the town is, it's important to think about how we've grown and how we've developed over time. And what better person to sit down with us today and talk about a huge milestone in the town's history than senior planner, Sandy Cross. If you know Duck, chances are you know Sandy. Uh, She was one of the town's very first employees and has seen the town develop and grow. So she's going to be sitting down with us to talk about the Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project to break it down so you can understand a little bit more about what makes this project so special, not only for Duck, but for the future of other coastal communities as well. All right, so welcome Sandy Cross and thanks for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Sure, so before we begin our conversation about the project itself, you've been here from the beginning, from the beginning of the town's incorporation. So I think it's really interesting to hear your perspective as far as looking at where the town is now and and where it started. And if you can take a step back and look at, you know, 22 years of duck, what is, I'm just curious, what's your main takeaway from where we started and where we are now? I would say first and foremost, forward thinking. That coupled with a strong sense of community and a town council that is very active in the community. And I could go on and on Please. on that subject alone. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want me to stay here or no, not. No, <laughs> you're good. You're good. We definitely do have a very strong community. Drew and I kind of talked about it a little bit in the last episode. Um, with that in mind, as far as you know, the town being forward thinking, that has a lot to do with our environment and where we are. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, that's part of the the whole premise of the incorporation was to to put things in the control of the people that live here and and allow us to to be forward thinking because I don't think that the residents and the community prior to incorporation felt like they were they were going down that path. Right. And so it's important because we're surrounded by two bodies of water and you know we're going to be talking about a huge milestone in town's history. You bring up a very strong point as the town being forward thinking and I think this is a great Great point to illustrate that and paint that picture. So just to give our listeners a little bit of information, Sandy's been an integral part of the Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project. So we are going to dive into a conversation to get some more insight and information about why this project was necessary and how the elements of the project work. Because while you might be driving along Duck Road and you see, you know, some rocks and and you see freshly planted plants and a new turn lane, you might not exactly know the scope of the project. And Sandy's going to chat with us a little bit and break that down so you have a better understanding and you can kind of formulate your own thoughts and and vision as to what it means to be a forward-thinking community. So there's a lot to unpack here, so stay with us. Uh, Sandy does a great job at explaining all of this. So just to start, um, Let's start with the most basic of questions to kind of set the scene of the Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project. Sandy, what was the overall intent of the project? Well, uh, it was a multifaceted intent. Um, We wanted to, first and foremost, elevate NC-12 to reduce flooding and increase resiliency of the roadway. We planned on restoring the native marsh to protect the shoreline and and improve natural habitat. we also, you know, when I say we we are forward thinking, we're also looking at shoreline projects throughout the community and and the differences between bulkheads and living shorelines and and which is more effective in terms of resiliency. So we saw this project as a as a huge um, opportunity to show others what can be done aside from a bulkhead and how more how much more resilient it can be in in terms of dealing with sea level rise and climate adaptation. Um, We also, you know, we're looking at bicycle and pedestrian connections within the village. Uh, We've been working on that for quite some time following uh, the adoption of our comprehensive pedestrian plan in 2014. 
And this was just another piece of that, carrying it from um, along the west side from Resort Realty up to Sunset Grill. And, and lastly, you know, improving stormwater management and reducing flooding, enhancing water quality, you know, they all kind of mesh together in, in pretty large projects. So a lot of parts and pieces that kind of melded together into one. I had to just simplify it. We have elevating the road. We have improving our, our wetlands, our coastal wetlands improving pedestrian opportunities and bicycle opportunities and improving stormwater. So with all of that, it's something that's kind of transgressed over time. And when when would you say that this, the idea of what the Living Shoreline and Resiliency Project could achieve, when did that first appear on the town's radar? Several core elements of the project, specifically the sidewalk extension and the Living Shoreline, were identified as early as 2018. Um, and then in, in 2019, Western Carolina University completed a vulnerability assessment study for the town of Duck. And this section of NC-12 was identified as the most vulnerable roadway in our community. So that that lends itself to, you know, items in our hazard mitigation plan, which speak to resiliency and protecting NC-12 and, and dealing with and addressing flooding and stormwater issues along NC-12. So uh, one thing that you mentioned in your answer um, was the hazard mitigation plan. And that is a planning document that we have here in the town. Can you explain a little bit about that and what the purpose is and what that serves to do for the town? So the hazard mitigation plan helps the the town to identify, well, it doesn't help. It, It actually identifies hazards. It assesses vulnerability of people and property it also assesses our community's capability of dealing with those hazards. Um, it, in addition to identifying these these hazards, it looks at our policies, our values, our goals. And from all that information, we develop mitigation strategies and implementation plans and timelines to, to deal with things. So like if we have a si- situation where we have flooding, we have that in the hazard mitigation plan. It may be it may be specific to a particular area, or it may be more more uh, uh, broad in terms of just improving stormwater infiltration. It may be um, you know identifying ways that we can reach out to our communities and and improve our communication with them. So it, it's a it's a pretty widespread document, but it's very dynamic and it's intended to give us guidance as we try to improve potential vulnerabilities in our community. We update it annually, um, and then every five years, we actually come together with the local municipalities within Dare County and Currituck County as well, and update it as a regional plan. So there's, it's not just designed for the town of Duck, it's, it's also designed for the, the entire uh, local area. And that's something that's actually currently underway, too, as well, right? Yep. We actually just kicked off, um, I believe, April 22nd was our first public meeting for the Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan update. Great. And do you know off the top of your head when the next meeting is or how if someone wanted to be involved? I do not have that information yet. I would encourage them to either reach out to me directly or um, check our website because our website will be updated with additional uh, outreach opportunities. Going back to the Coastal Resiliency Project, another plan that this involves is the town's comprehensive pedestrian plan, which outlines a vision for a pedestrian-friendly community. Can you tell us a little bit about how this plan came into play when this overall project was being discussed and planned? So in 2014, the town uh, went through a pretty extensive process and developed their comprehensive pedestrian plan. That pedestrian plan had has a lot of different parts and pieces as well. Um, some were as simple as just improving our crosswalk striping with high visibility um, thermoplastic. Others included, you know, for those that have been around for a while, the town of Duck and the village used to just be a bike lane, and you had bikers and pedestrians walking through um, directly adjacent to vehicles traveling through the the uh, village as well. So. This plan had a phased approach to not necessarily widen Duck Road, but 
to separate the bike lane from the pedestrian walking area and add a sidewalk and add infiltration strips. That plan was from Aqua Restaurant on the south side to essentially Resort Realty on the north side on the west side of Duck Road and then from Aqua to Sunset Grill on the east side of Duck Road. That left the stretch between Resort Realty and Sunset Grill on the west side of Duck Road unimproved, still with the simple bike lane, um, which was also subject to flooding when we have uh, westerly storm wind storms. Uh, so, you know, following the adoption of the 2014 plan and the beginning phases of implementation of these sidewalk projects, the town did look at extending this plan to include the west side, but at that time there was not enough support for it. However, fast forward, we finished phase one of the sidewalks, phase two of the sidewalks, and then we finished phase three, which was the east side from Resort Realty up to Barry Island Station. And we're working on this project, this this living shoreline project, and then a lot of things happen very quickly, and we ended up uh, with a design to elevate the road. And uh, we ended up with a project that allowed us the opportunity to connect the dots. And so, you know, still maintaining the view um, and creating an environment where we can improve stormwater and improve resiliency, the sidewalk made logical sense to tie into the most northern crosswalk in the village, which is at Sunset Grill on the west side. So you're really looking at a, a the epitome of a two birds, one stone type of situation there. And I think it's also interesting to think about, you know, you have one project and another one pops up on the radar and, you know, obviously you can't do anything without some sort of funding. And so people may or may not know, but that was that was a huge a huge plus side of combining the two. And I don't want to get into the weeds too, too much because there's a lot of there's a lot of data and figures and all of that is available if anybody wants it. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the funding process? Because that also is important to think about when we consider the fact that this was kind of a bundled project. So uh, the funding uh, is very complicated. Um, and it, it started back in, in 2019 when in 2020, when the town had received grant money from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in the amount of $384,000, uh, as well as the Deer County Tourism Board, um, they were um, providing a grant fund in the amount of $148,000. We were ready to pre proceed with the, the a sidewalk project on the west side, as well as a living shoreline project. Just as we were about to bid it out, um, we the um, FEMA came out with the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities program that had a large, very large pot of money, Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. I go back to that because that was one of the main points. And, and it, when you're speaking about resilient, you, you want to be reflecting and doing things that are long term. So, you know, the living shoreline was one part and the sidewalk was one part, but the elevating the road was another big piece um, that we were looking at. And so the town had been approved for funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in the amount of $384,000. That was to pay for our living shoreline project. We also had a grant from Deer County Tourism Bureau in the amount of $148,000 for the west side uh, sidewalk improvements. We were ready to proceed with both of these projects in fall of 2020 when FEMA came out with their uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program. We often refer this refer to this as BRIC, B-R-I-C for short. Um, when that came out, the town looked at our hazard mitigation plan and our vulnerability assessment and said, wait a minute, here's an opportunity for us to potentially get a lot more money and do something much more resilient. So we shifted gears. 
um, and looked at developing a more comprehensive resiliency project that included raising the elevation of NC-12, adding some stormwater management improvements. And when we talked with our consultants, uh, which was primarily VHB, and state representatives who were helping us with consideration of the BRIC grant, it was suggested that we had a much better opportunity to obtain a BRIC grant for a substantial amount of money if we kept the Living Shoreline and the Sidewalk Project in the grant application that we were submitting to FEMA. And that's how we ended up with a much more resilient and multifaceted project. So you mentioned a few of the agencies that we had uh, worked with to receive funding from this project, but there are quite a few others. Can you tell us a little bit about who else was involved? So in addition to National Fish and Wildlife and Deer County Tourism, um, you know, I mentioned BRIC. That's a, a FEMA, FEMA partner. We also worked with Deer County Soil and Water Conservation for um, a grant to help with the marsh plantings. And then uh, the North Carolina Depart Department of Emergency Management came out with some grant money following COVID. Um, and we were awarded $550,000 from them in June of 2022 to defray, defray some of the project cost increase. Because, you know, we started working on this in 2020 and then COVID happened. And we all know what happened with COVID. So, you know, the cost of everything was, was going up. And so we submitted a supplemental grant to the state and we were awarded that money. Fast forward, um, we ended up still way over budget um, with, uh, in comparison to the grant money that we were receiving and the Department of Emergency Management at the state level awarded us another $1 million in May of 2024. So that's a lot of money. And I didn't even mention that we got $1.849 million from FEMA. So we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of over $3 million, um, $3.5 million. If you want to do, if you want me to do the math, I can do it. But it's a lot of money. <laughs> Great work on you guys for finding those grant opportunities to offset that cost because this was an expensive project. And, you know, unfortunately with COVID, with the cost of materials increasing and and just everything kind of taking a, a pause, you know, while that happened, it's nice to see that all of this finally comes together. And, you know, the $1 million grant, that's new. That's yeah. this month. So, And and, and, I'm, and speaking of the grants, I really, really want to give a lot of kudos to Joe Hurd and um, his efforts with, along with VHB, for, for putting these grant applications together, getting them in a timely manner, getting them in complete, and then following up with them. And then Drew, Drew Havens came through, um, you know, when the emergency management grants were um, the result of his contacts at the state and him, you know, basically sending it down the line and letting us take hold and, and get those applications in. It's a big team effort to to find those those dollars that can help offset any cost. So, um, yeah, and I was going to mention Joe as well because he's been, he's another person you're, that's very instrumental in this project too, and I don't want to slight him by any means because he's oh, he's, he's been a big part of it <laughs> yes so um thank you joe joe if you are not aware is the director of community development so uh continuing on uh let's talk about the fun stuff now so where the project actually occurred which was between the former resort realty building and sunset grill um that's again directly adjacent to the Curatuck sound meeting like you said this area is highly susceptible to to overwash and shoreline erosion so Knowing that going into this project, what were some of the challenges when designing this project regarding the natural environment? I can't speak for our designers specifically, but I can say from my perspective, uncertainty uncertainty was certainly one of those challenges. Um, there's not a lot of projects out there like this that you can model from, that you can say this is this is guaranteed to work. So we are somewhat going into uncharted territories. Um, but fortunately, we have a great team of engineers and scientists and planners and designers 
from VHB. They bring a lot to the table. Um, you know, I, I don't work with just one person. I mean, I have one contact primarily, but I, when he has a question, he goes to someone else on his team, just like we have a, a bunch of people on our team. And fortunately, we have a great team of engineers, scientists, planners, and designers from VHB, our consulting firm, that developed the plan and have administered permitting and construction of the project. With their knowledge and their expertise, we feel that the design is resilient and sustainable. Other challenges, uh, so I'm going to get a little technical here, <laughs> um, and this is definitely my wheelhouse. This area, the area where this project is 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 occurring is located in what we call the air, an area of environmental concern. That's a term that was developed by the state in the late 70s. Um, and because it's in an area of environmental concern, we are subject to CAMA regulations, and that's the Coastal Area Management Act. So permitting was quite the challenge. It's not like just building a single family residence. You have a large area, you're dealing with um, a revetment, you're dealing with fill, thin layer placement fill, and um, a lot of development within what we call the 75-foot AEC. Um, going back to area of environmental concern, we use acronym acronyms all the time. Um, this was a major CAMA permit, so we were dealing with state and federal agencies, and so there was a quite a, quite a bit of back and forth between agencies, and that took quite a bit of time. Um, and then I think... <laughs> Going back to Jerry Maguire, popped <laughs> in my head when I saw this question. Um, show me the money. Um, that was a big factor working on a project of this size and scope. And as we already noted, um, we were ready to go in 2020 when the BRIC program was released. We put that original project on hold. And here we are four years later, um, just getting the project started and completed because the money. You can't go forward without the money. Mm-hmm. Um, notifications that you're receiving the money are great, but until you actually have an award letter, you can't start the project. So we literally put the Dare County Tourism and the National Fish and Wildlife grants on hold, and they were generous, gracious enough to let us carry them over into multiple fiscal years um, and then, you know, add the, the increased cost that resulted following covid and all of the inflation that we've seen, you know, go back to show me the money. You got to have the money in order to make this happen, especially when it ended up being over a $4 million project. Lastly, Mother Nature. I talk about Mother Nature a lot when I do beach plantings. Um, she is no different on the ocean front than she is on the sound front. Um, she wields a lot of power, power, and in a project like this, you are at her mercy. Um, fortunately, we were able to get the sills in place pretty quickly, and I'm pretty sure we'll talk a little bit more about those. And they played a substantial part in the way this project actually progressed forward. So, yeah, we'll definitely get into the mechanics of what the sills are. But, you know, when you mentioned that the sills played a substantial part into the way that the project progressed, were the sills designed to be installed first as, you know, a measure of foresight to mitigate some of the wave energy that might come from a storm as the project began? I don't know that, that I would consider them as much foresight as just um, instrumental and logical to do first. The fact that they went in so quickly was a key part of this project, and they boogied. Milston Marine was phenomenal getting this in place. So let's go back to when you were talking about raising the road and break down some of the elements of this project because it's important to understand that it's much more than just raising the road but let's start there how much was the road raised and what went into the decision making process as far as how much to actually raise the road so the road was the, the road was raised approximately three feet at its highest point um, the low point was somewhere between Dune Road and Sea Colony at about 2.8 feet above mean sea level. The goal of this project, when we look at, you know, forward thinking again, sea level rise expectations and what we're going to be looking like looking at in, in 2050 and, and 2100, um, 
our our primary goal was to get the road to an elevation of five feet. Um, that made sense because the areas north and south of our low point tied in at five feet. So we didn't want to create any additional flooding issues by raising the road too much and then sending water elsewhere. So this was the 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 best elevation to put us at a pretty much a neutral zone for water coming from rain events and and then also putting us at a at an elevation where overwash might splash but it's not going to inundate and it will maintain continuous traffic travel through the area all right ad lib here because i didn't actually write a question about this so when you see the overwash splash there's some new rocks there there are a lot of new rocks that have been added they're not just for decoration um can you tell us about those and um you know what their purpose serves and and how that ties into the project as well as as you know, being part of the living shoreline and coastal resiliency idea. So the rocks that you see now are essentially what was there before, but they are much, much larger. Uh, they're what we call armor stone. And so what we did was we created an armor stone revetment. Um, they remove the old stone, for lack of better words, riprap that was previously there. Um, that was much smaller stone, and I don't know what class it was, uh, but our engineers felt like we needed to start fresh. So they pulled out all of the old stone. They laid fabric like you might see behind a, uh, a bulkhead. They laid um, some base stone to keep everything in place and, and create an area to start laying the large armor stone, which is, um, you know, those stones average about three tons, I believe. Uh, and then there were some smaller stones placed to fill in the gaps. But the goal was to keep those rocks from ending up on Duck Road if we got a storm that was going to overtop Duck Road. Which has happened before, and I know we'll probably talk about some of the storms, but um, one of the pictures that I can vividly recall is, was it after Hurricane Isabel? No, it was Hurricane Irene. Irene, and there were rocks all over Duck Road. Yes, there's there's actually been um, several storms that I, I'll bring up. Yeah, so um, another part of that, and, and when I'm thinking about talking about the project and breaking it down, people are going to see this and might not necessarily understand that, you know, it's not just a bulkhead out in the water or... You know, it's not just a wooden wall. They might not necessarily be familiar with the different elements of what goes into um, coastal resiliency projects, such as these sills. So knowing that they're sills and you've kind of touched on what they do um, and how they how they play a role in this project. Can you tell us a little bit more specific information about what role they have and, and what these sills do? So. What we have out there are vi what we call vinyl sills, uh, but sills come in a variety of forms. They can be stone, they can be living or artificial reef systems. In our case, we were very limited on space, so um, and we weren't allowed to impact any existing subaquatic vegetation, which is called we refer to as SAVs. So we needed to stay landward of these SAVs that were out in the water. And our engineers designed, um, came up with the vinyl de vinyl sill design, which is common. You, you see it on the Outer Banks frequently. Um, but essentially, vinyl sills are wood structures, and then they have vinyl sheet piles that are jetted into the into the the base of the the shoreline floor, and they have gaps between them that allow water to pass through. Um, and, and sediment to pass through as well, while at the same time dissipating the wave energy that's going to actually make it to the shore. So it's kind of like if you can imagine a sandbar on the ocean front. It's kind of the same concept, except it's a fixed structure. It's not going to move like a sandbar would move. 
Right. And we talked about it earlier when we were talking about seeing the, you know, with the sills going in first, if that was something that was intended as a foresight to help progress the project along. But it was really neat to see them work because, I mean, right off the bat, there were some pretty strong storms that came through and we were already getting to see the benefit of having those sills in place to dissipate that wave energy. And there are several others too. Do you, do you remember any of those off the top of your head? How many storms? I mean, I, I counted four <laughs> from the time this project started until uh, today, honestly. Like, uh, we had November 27th, December 18th, February 13th, and April 12th. They were all west wind storms that could have easily topped Duck Road. And if I, if I think back from 2011 to 2023, when this project began... I come up with four storms over the course of 13 years that did that. So take 13 years and only four storms. And in the course of six months, we've had four. So forethought, whether it was forethought or not, I, I'm just going to say we were really lucky we got this mm-hmm. project underway when we did, um, just in time. Yeah, yeah. And there's a really cool video that uh, Jim Gould, who's one of the planners here, he got where you can see the white caps from the sound. And then as soon as it hits those sills, it's, I don't want to say necessarily calm, but it you can see a visible difference. There's no white caps versus white caps. So um, it's pretty neat. And I, it's on our social media and our YouTube channel. So if you want to see it in action, it's there. And I'll also note, too, that what's nice about this is there are a lot of people that might not necessarily live in Duck, but they work in Duck or drive up to Kerala or to the southern beaches. And we've gotten a lot of feedback of people saying that this is part of their commute and it's it's they see it in action. And so it's it's from a from a PIO standpoint, it's kind of nice to see that they can also appreciate the efforts and understand the importance of doing something like this. Yeah, I think uh I think it may have been last week or so we got an email from a contractor who's back and forth between Kerala and he's like I've been driving this road for 20 years. This is the best thing you guys have ever mm-hmm. done. It's fantastic. You're spot on. And he actually mentioned the storms. He's like, there's been several storms this winter where you we would have had flooding. You know, I, I again, i just impressed with how spot on this project has been. And it's, it's progressed along nicely. And um, last week or the week before, I'm losing track of my days, but they finished the planting. So... You know, something else that people might notice when they drive by are plants and not just only on, you know, the not just along the sidewalk, but also in the marsh as well. And that is something that's still in the works to be done. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the vegetative part of this process? Because obviously we've had rocks, we've had sills, the road, but what about the vegetation involved? So uh, the sidewalk project throughout the village has included uh, what we call an infiltration strip between the bike lane and the sidewalk. And that infiltration strip is actually a stormwater measure that was intentional. Um, it has, uh, it's about 24 inches deep and it's got some filter cloth in it. And then we've got uh, a bed of gravel to help with um, stormwater. And then we use a bio soil in there and then we planted it. That is partly aesthetic partly to keep people from crossing at places that are that don't have crosswalks, but it's primarily intended to be a stormwater measure. That being said, it's a very small area, um, and we previously, in previous phases of the sidewalk project, had planted something called little blues uh, or blue stems, and they are meant to be in a much wilder environment. So we have since been transitioning to the use of liriope. Um, and you essentially have to have a, a plant that is somewhat of a unicorn because you've got stormwater runoff, you've got you know, vehicle soot, you've got salty environment. It's just really not a great place for plants to be. Um, but this um, liriope has been a winner so far, and uh, I expect that it'll do very well in this location and throughout the rest of the village. And then if we get into the plantings on the, in the marsh, uh, we've got some uh, shrubs that have already been planted. They're called marsh elder, 
um, our landscape or emerald forest uh, has not quite finished all that. We again, we'll go back to Mother Nature. <laughs> she has a lot of control over the, the pace of things that happen, especially when we're dealing with it on the on the sound side. And uh, so we've had a, a couple of days where he was able to get the marsh elder in place, but he still has to plant more marsh elder. And we will also be planting uh, what's called Juncus Romerianus. Uh, most people know it as black needle rush. Um, this is, uh, I believe its common name came from way back in the day when it was used as a needle because of its sharp pointy edge. So, um, we hope to see those plantings happening probably in the next week, looking at the forecast. Um, and, you know, the black needle rush is another method to dissipate wave energy. The marsh elder is going to improve uh, the marsh habitat for wildlife and songbirds and will essentially become a thicket that um, will promote habitat. You know, I have to say, and let me be corny for a minute because I do think it's truly impressive how much you know, like, genuinely like it's mind-blowing how much you know about just everything in this project and and how much you're involved in and I don't know I think it's pretty cool so props to you on that well, um, thank you I still make <laughs> you nervous <laughs> um going back to imagine driving down this road and looking at the project you know let's talk about the actual road it's been raised has it been widened? What what happened there? There's also a new turn lane but you know one of the questions we get a lot is you know was the road widened? So the road is slightly wider uh, between Cook Drive and just south of Sea Colony. That was a late revision to the plan to address concerns regarding future development at Resort Realty. Uh, there were concerns from the neighboring community that redevelopment of this property without a proper turn lane into the property from the south would be dangerous. Um, and so they expressed a lot of concerns that this would also impact traffic. These concerns were heard by council, and council asked staff to work with our engineers, VHB, to see if see if we could extend the, the turn lane to accommodate these concerns. During the review and planning of that to see if it was possible, it was determined that we could, in fact, extend the turn lane to Dune Road or the northern entrance to Resort Realty. We also were able to, in looking at this design, this change, extend or create a left-hand turn lane coming from the south onto Dune Road. So we felt like this would satisfy the concerns of the community that was adjacent to this area and also provide a another mitigation to potential traffic issues for someone trying to turn left into Dune Road. So it was a win-win. Um, council, again, got to give them a lot of credit for, for hearing the community and having staff move forward with some revisions. So there's obviously, you know, aside from working with engineers and contractors, you know, council has had a role in this as well. But, you know, one thing that I I do want to talk about, you know, again, going back to a PIO standpoint, you know, the communication that I've seen and I stepped into this while the project was already kind of underway. Um, so coming into this and seeing the level of communication that was existing between the town and its partners. I think it's it's important and it really kind of set the tone for me as a PIO going into big projects because, again, this was my first one, how to keep that information flow going between the town and the partners and also the community, too. So can you, from your experience being, you know, a main point of contact in this, what was the communication process like from the onset of this project? Well, I shoo, go back four years. Well, um, so... I can tell you VHB presented to town council at their monthly meetings on a regular occasion on this project. Uh, at their retreats, we had regular updates. Because, again, you, 
going back from the time we initiated the the grant requests and the with FEMA to the permitting with the agencies, VHB was constantly providing council with timeline updates because those timelines changed while we were waiting for the money. Um, but during the process, as we got closer to, we know this is going to happen. The permits are coming now. We're simply waiting on an award letter. Then we started working on easements, and we may touch on that a little, little more detail, but there was a lot of communication with adjacent property owners in this project area. Then um, once the project got underway, there was a schedule of um, biweekly meetings with VHB, our, our, our con construction administrator, and Fred Smith's company who was the contractor on record and even sometimes with some of their their subcontractors were here like Millstone Marine was at a couple meetings as well so you know we did those meetings every two weeks every two weeks you know you were getting updates you were putting and you were putting stuff out every week uh, in terms of what we could anticipate now did the things change absolutely in a project of size it always, always. changes <laughs> there's always this caveat subject to change depending on weather conditions mother nature um, other factors other factors <laughs> equipment delays um so um we tried to maintain continuous contact through your mechanisms which are social media and e-news and our meetings with the contractors and and when we felt like it was necessary for direct communication with impacted parties, for instance, Fred Smith went with a 24-7 operational time frame while they were demolishing the asphalt roadway, which they called reclamation, and when they were filling. There was a lot of noise going to be impacted. There was going to be lights. So we made a point to direct email impacted parties. So. You know, there's a lot of parts and pieces. There were a lot of players involved in making sure communication was getting out and getting to the right people. So, you know, I I, I could start listing them, but the list would be long. Yes, yes. And, you know, one thing that was really helpful, too, Fred Smith would send two or three week look ahead. So that way, you know, we had kind of a big picture outlook of what the timeline was going to be. And, you know, going back to even the 24-7 schedule, we put out a press release maybe a, a month or so before that schedule change actually occurred just to give people a heads up because it was something that would be a you know a big change of the work schedule considering the the time in which construction occurred and the noise and the lights but even the, to that regard they were mindful about having lights that only pointed to the west yeah and they were mindful about not offloading any trucks you know at certain times of day so well, and quite honestly like the the 24 7 schedule didn't necessarily mean that they were working 24 7 right. they actually utilized that mechanism to allow them to maintain their project site without having to demobilize and reopen both lanes of traffic at the end of each working day which was a requirement of the design which would have hindered start time in the morning and would have decreased their working hours during the day. So, you know, I think people had a misconception that they were going to be actually working, and and that may may have just been our verbiage. Um, but you know, the goal was to to maintain that that work product as efficiently as possible, which meant if we could leave the road with a one lane closure while this heavy work was going, this heavy road work was going on, that we could expedite the process. Yep, yep. And, you know, with all that to, to say that it's, you know, they did their best to mitigate any sort of inconvenience, you know, there were some minor ones with lane closures and sidewalk closures, but, you know, this definitely has more of a beneficial long-term impact. So kind of that thought process as far as being forward thinking too, you know, when we think about the living shoreline and um, coastal resiliency project and preserving our environment and being forward thinking. Do you, going back to what you said too about there not really being any sort of blueprint for a project like this, do you hope that this will set a precedent or 
you know, serve as a model or a guide for other coastal communities? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I see this as a, a blueprint for other communities. And and we're going to do our best to make sure that other communities are made aware or, or able to to get our information um, through um, presentations. We're planning on presenting this to North Carolina Coastal Resiliency Community of Practice in July, as well as Wetlands Watch to Virginia. Uh, we are also looking at submitting abstracts for the APA and C conference and the C grant conference, as well as NC Byways conference this fall. So um, I think that once we start getting the word out on this project and how it came together, I think other communities might take take a look and and use it as a blueprint for sure. Great. Well, is there anything else you wanted to add? I know we, we covered a lot and you did a great job. Again, thank you for breaking that down. And I hope people are able to listen to this and, and know a little bit more about, you know, the area that they traverse along and understand a little bit more about what this project actually entails. But is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, you know, I think that uh, when you drive through Ducks, take it in, you know. Think about when you're sitting in traffic, think about all the work that went into this project. Um, And when you're not sitting in traffic because there's water on the roadway, think about this project. Um, We want to be good stewards of our environment. And I think this project is an example of that. Mm -hmm. And it can also on a smaller scale, be an example for individual homeowners or HOAs um, or communities to do things that are resilient on the sound. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Always happy to chat with you, Sandy. And thanks for being the second guest on this podcast. So I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Great.